Hey everybody. Sorry, I'm uh, I'm recording today's lecture, so uh, so I spent a bit of time on setup there. That's why I'm a bit late. Um, but I will upload this lecture when uh, when we're done. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is this is a lecture that's added. It's not something I taught last year, but I think it's something that is worth teaching and that you guys will will enjoy hearing about. Um, and what the lecture is about is handling data. How many of you have actually done lab six or attempted lab six, even if not finished? Okay, cool. That's a decent amount. So you'll have seen some of the concepts in today's lecture. Um, but I want to specifically talk about a couple of interesting things that come in when you're handling data. Okay. So the, the reality of making a mobile app is that fundamentally what you're normally building is some sort of data delivery mechanism, right? What you're building is a way to share and use data. Okay. And so a number of questions come up. One question is, should you, should you store the data locally or globally? Anyone have any ideas on whether you should store data locally or globally? So a good intuition there is globally. But, but here's an interesting question. If the answer is always globally, why can we store stuff locally? Like why does the facility exist if it's not something we should be using? Right? So what I want you to, to sort of keep in mind is that often if a function exists, it's because it has some value, right? If, um, if, if, if we found that you should always stuff, store stuff globally, there wouldn't be a way to store it locally because people would go, well, there's no point in doing that, right? So the reality is there is some reason to store data locally, okay? Um, anyone have any ideas? Why would you want to store data locally? You don't have to send the data back and forth. Perfect. So one big reason is that if the data is on your device, you have no need to communicate, right? The data is just sitting there on your device. And this can be useful for any number of reasons. One reason might be to reduce latency, right? Delay. Anytime you've got to communicate over the internet to a web server and wait for a response, there's a, there's a potential problem. The other reason you might want to do it is to deal with um, spotty connections, right? If you, if you have to do an internet request to get your data and then you don't have internet, what, what do you do, right? You just don't have the data. Um, in one of the projects that I've worked on commercially, for instance, we did like a, um, a project where nurses would go to the mines and uh, help with with healthcare, basically check things like blood pressure, glucose, HIV on the mines, right? But often you'd get to a mine and then there's no internet. Now we made an app that allows the nurses to capture that data, but if we didn't have local storage, that data would just get lost because you'd be sitting there at the mine entering it in and when you say save, it would say you cannot connect to the internet and then you'd lose all that data, right? So there is some value to storing that data locally. Um, what? Problems can you see with storing data locally instead of globally? Cool, that's a, that's a really good one, is your mobile device has a capacity which may not be large enough, right? If you need to store tons of data, you can't just store all of that on your device. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one as well, resilience. So if you, if you change devices, one reason might be because you broke your phone. Um, or you lost your phone, and now that data is gone, right? Whereas if you store it globally on the cloud, it lasts forever. Um, anyone else? Okay. One other um, big weakness of storing data locally is that it can't be shared, right? So like if we uh, think of something like Facebook, if you type in your status into the Facebook app and it stores it locally, no one else is going to see your status update, right? Because it's not on the internet, it's on your device. Okay, everyone happy with that? So what's the difference between distributed storage and cloud storage? So distributed storage um, is a sort of concept where what you're trying to do is parallelize your data access. Okay, so it's not strictly relevant in this context, but basically what it is is that if you, if you do your storage in the cloud, 
you're saying there's a database sitting somewhere in the cloud. Now, that database may be one database in reality, or it may be hundreds of databases that are all collaborating to share a particular piece of data. So if you take something like Facebook, something that large, they use concepts called sharding and replication, where instead of the database sitting on one machine and on one drive, it's sitting on hundreds of machines. And when a request comes in, they can load balance and say, okay, the request is gonna come from this data rather than this data. You have a thing called sharding, where it says that um, certain pieces, certain segments of the data are gonna be stored on some machines rather than others. So that saves you storage space and means that no machine is gonna get completely full. So for instance, if you're Facebook, let's say you happen to have 26 servers, you may decide, hey, people with surnames ending in A go on this server, people with surnames ending in D go on this server. So that way your data is distributed, but it's very easy to, to, to figure out where any piece of data is gonna be. That's a distributed database. But it just being on the cloud isn't necessarily distributed. Any other questions? Cool. Okay. Uh... Okay, now when you store stuff locally, how do you do it? The most straightforward way is you keep data in variables, right? Um, you just have some array list and in that array list, you've got your, your objects and all the data in those objects and, and all is good. The problem is that that data doesn't persist. That means if you close the app and open it again, your variables are reset, right? So suddenly you don't have that data anymore. So a more common thing to do is to store things in SQLite databases. So you guys have seen MySQL and you guys have seen SQLite in lab four, I think it was. Um, and SQLite is sort of a local database that can be embedded into apps, okay? It's not just for Android. It can be used on desktop computers or uh, in your web browser. It can be, any, you can use SQLite anywhere, right? So I don't want you to make the mistake of thinking it's for Android apps. But what it is, it's an, is, it's an embedded database. So when you're using like some, something like MySQL, you've got a database and you've got your application and your application connects to the database and talks to it and you do all sorts of data manipulation. However, when you're using SQLite, that database sits inside your program. It's not a separate program that, that needs to be accessed over some network port or something like that. No, it, it becomes part of the program you're writing, okay? Another way to store stuff locally is just to store it in files. So if you've got uh, some data, you can just write it to a text file and save that text file. Or if you've got images, you can just write them directly onto the SD card of the device this is the thing that your camera does, for instance, right? If you use the camera app on your phone, when you take a picture, it doesn't go into a database. It just saves a file on your device. And your apps can do the same thing if they want. They can just store things in files. Uh, and that's quite flexible because it's just a file. You can do whatever you want. But often it's harder to work with that because you don't have something like SQL to select data. You have to read all these files manually. Anytime you have to do something manually, it kind of sucks because you may get it wrong. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about those three strategies? Basically storing stuff in memory, storing stuff in SQLite or storing stuff in files? Okay, but storing stuff locally isn't always great because lots of data needs to be shared, right? It's only useful if it's shared. Um, so what do we do? Now, you guys have if you guys have started working on Lab 6, you've seen the kind of things we can do. But you may be thinking, well, why do we do this? And, and we'll get to that in this lecture. So um, the most straightforward architecture you can think of is, well, you've got the cloud. Sorry, You've got the cloud. And in the cloud, you've got a database. Your app then directly connects to the database using SQL and gets the data it needs. This would be very similar to what you did in lab four, right? You can just say like select star from students and send it to your MySQL database and get a result. That sounds quite cool, right? You just connect directly to a database and all is good. Now, the problem is this becomes really hard for security because if we say that the app's gonna do this, we need the database to allow it. The database needs to allow connections coming in from the app to just run arbitrary SQL queries, right? Now, while in, 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 in MySQL, we can say this table belongs to this user, so he's the only one who can update it. That level of security 
is not granular enough. It's not fine enough. The problem is, let's say you want to register, right? You want to register to, to be on the app. That means you need to modify the user table, right? You, when you register on the app, the app is going to say something like insert into users, values, pravesh, comma, password, whatever. Does that make sense to everybody? So that means I'll have to configure MySQL to make sure that users coming in from the app can modify the users table. But if they can modify the users table, they can just change other people's passwords and change other people's usernames and access levels and stuff, right? So MySQL doesn't provide a mechanism for us to allow people to access the user table, but not edit other people's records, okay? So what we do instead is we create a web service. Okay, well, before, before I talk about that, the safest thing you can do is just not allow anyone to access the database, right? And then you're safe. <laughs> but there's obviously a big problem there, right? You're not going to get hacked. But I mean, it's kind of, kind of pointless, right? Um, so what we do is, surprisingly, we do exactly this. We make it so that you cannot access, access the database from the internet. You can only access the database from the machine the database is running on. But then how do apps talk to the database? Well, what we do is we create a web application. We create um, a web service that connects to the database. So if you look at the structure, we're saying the database only talks to the web application and the web application talks to the app, okay? In, our, in the case of this course, we're gonna do those web applications in PHP, but they can be written in Java. They're most commonly written in, uh, in, in fact, Java is one of the most common. Uh, C Sharp is a very common language. Python is a very common language and JavaScript is a very common language. You can pick whatever you like. It doesn't really matter. We're using PHP because while it's not the best when you have a very large website, it's really easy when you have a very small website, which is what's gonna happen in this course. Um, but what's cool is PHP code is just normal code, like Java code. So that means we can implement our own security. We can say, look, if the person uh, accessing the site is uh, Pravesh, then he can change the user's table generally. But if the person accessing the site is someone untrustworthy, like say Steve, then we say, no, he can only change his own record. So we, he can only change his own record. He can't change anyone else's, right? Um, and, and that code is up to us. So we can do whatever we like. It's not like the database MySQL where it's not up to us. Someone else wrote that program. So yeah, looking at our login example, what we do is let's say we want people to register. We can make a file called register.php, which would be our web application that registers uh, students or registers users. And what you have to send to that script is like a username and password so the person can register, right? And all that script does is insert into the user table or check if the user exists and if it doesn't insert into the user table. Now, because the database can, I mean, the mobile app can access that web service, people can register. They just call register.php with that function and they can, they can do an insert, right? And that script has no access to now change the rest of the tables. So that means now the app can only insert into the table. Does that make sense? If I wanted people to be able to modify users from the app, I could make a separate script called like modifyuser.php and that'll take in some other parameters and can update the, the table. But what I could do is in the top of that script, I could say, well, first check if this is the user that's allowed to do so. Does that make sense? So how would you go about doing that through the web? So why don't you just put that security? So, so the trouble is the app, that, that's a very good question. The question is, why wouldn't you just put that security in the app and say, well, look, we've got a piece of code running here. Why can we not just um, why can we not just uh, tell the app that if the person is an admin user they can they can get to the modify user screen and they can modify but if if they don't have that they can't and there's a very good reason the reason is the app is not under your control as soon as you give the app to users they could modify it without your knowledge. So meaning right now, you've got the Facebook app, for instance. You could, if you wanted to, decompile it, change the code, and, and use it, right? So security that just sits in the app 
is not security because once it's on someone else's device, they can do whatever they want with it. So you can have access to that database. They can they the can app. change like if your if statement in the in the app says if Pravesh is admin do something, right? They could change it to if not Pravesh is admin do something and then basically you could suddenly have the opposite access. Does that so make sense? Yeah. So how do we have how, why is that not the same case with the web service? So the reason it's not the same with the web service is the web service never runs on the person's device. The web service runs on the LAMP server, which they don't have access to. In this case, in our case, the LAMP server, but in uh, for, for any app, it runs on the web server that the database and is running on. And it's just being called onto there. And it's just being called from there. From the, so the only thing the user can do is call the script with the right parameters. They can't modify the script. You know what I mean? If they had that PHP code running on their computer, then they could modify that PHP code and then cause the same problem. But that PHP code is not running so on their computer. The they don't have access to the PHP code. If by some chance they do get access to the PHP code, even that won't help them because when the PHP code runs, it'll try to connect to the database. But remember the database it has restricted all connections from the internet. It only allows connections from the same machine. So they'd have to somehow get that PHP code to be modified on the machine the database is running on. And that's really hard. At that point, they've hacked you and you're in trouble. We'll, we'll look at some tactics. Well, well, we'll look at one tactic for hacking sites that haven't coded themselves particularly well. Um, but fundamentally, we want to make sure the web service is secure because that's the port between the outside world and the computer we're in. You know what I mean? So the other thing is that the web service, how does it know it's talking to the app? It might be someone just sending the same messages the app would send. Do you know what I mean? So you got to make sure that the web app is, is secure, not the, not the mobile app. Okay, so often how we how we authenticate these requests is like, let's say we say you want to insert a car into the database. So you have an insert car script. What would you have to send? Based on the cars example you guys had previously, you'd have to send like the brand, the license plate number, the type. I can't remember what else there was. That might have been just those three. The brand, the license, license plate number, and the type, right? Name and, age. and the? Name and, age. Name and age, okay. But now, if you want to make sure that the person inserting a car was supposed to be inserting a car, your web service will accept those, but it'll also accept a username and password or a username and a login token so that we can check, does that user actually have the ability to insert cars? And if they don't, then we don't let them. So your mobile app, instead of just sending the required parameters, will send the required parameters and the required security tokens. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Now, that's all well and good, right? We're, we're now somewhere. This is actually kind of cool. Um, but security is quite a complex field because security comes down to trust, okay? Now, there's a couple of problems. And the first one we'll talk about is how do we trust our communication? When I say I'm talking to FNB, for instance, can I guarantee that I'm talking to FNB and no one in the middle can see what I'm doing and no one in the mod in the middle can pretend to be me and talk. No one in the middle can pretend to be FNB. How do we accomplish that? How do we accomplish that I can trust the channel I'm talking to? Some of this comes down to the architecture of the internet. How much do you guys know about routing, internet routing? Probably not that much. Okay, you're going to do a networking course in, this, in the second semester and that'll, that'll clear it up. But basically how the internet works is there's never a direct connection between me and the person I want to talk to. Just doesn't happen. What happens is messages get passed along various computers and eventually they get to the one that I'm talking to. So let's say, picture it as if I want to send a note to you. You're sort of directly connected to me, right? Because I'm right here, I'll just give you the note. But if I want to talk to the person four rows back, maybe I'll give you the note and you'll pass it to the person behind you and he'll pass it to the person next to him and he'll pass it to the person and this note just keeps going. But what if I wrote my username and password on the note and then I gave it to you and you passed it along there? That'd be a problem, right? Because that'll mean everyone in the middle gets to see my username and password. Does that make sense? So when you use the labs, for instance, 
you when you type your username and password into something like firefox how does that get to gmail it goes through the ethernet right which is this cable that's running connecting every machine in that lab meaning the person sitting next to you gets that same message that they can that they can read right they can check your password they can check your your whatever it is you type they can see it they can see what websites you went to live while you're going there um and if you're interested in this there's a program called wireshark uh you can try running it and if you run it it'll show you all the network all the network traffic that's happening you can like filter it by ip address maybe you know where your friend is sitting you can filter it and you can see all your friends traffic you can see what sites is visiting and what is doing on those sites <laughs> because because that note is getting passed to everybody right um and that's a problem right that's it's not just a privacy problem because the other problem is that i can also modify your packets this is something called a man in the middle attack and it's quite a common attack where what i can do is let's say let's say i sent you a note to get to fnb that says send money to richard you could say nope scratch out the richard send money to me and then you give it to fnb they send the money to you <laughs> do you know what i mean so that's called the man in the middle attack and it's a real problem how we deal with it is we use something called ssl which encrypts the data okay so when i talk to fnb we have these asymmetric encryption keys where what i do is i use my public key I mean uh, the 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 other guy's public key to encrypt the data and he then uses his private key to decrypt it okay this works because of a technique called asymmetric encryption and uh, you guys might have heard of the algorithm RSA you often see like RSA is the algorithm used on these things but how it works basically is you've got a public each person has a public key, public key and a private key in order to encrypt data you need the public key in order to decrypt that data you need the private key now what's useful about that is it means fnb can share their public key with me it's public i can use it to encrypt the data i can't use it to decrypt data because that's not how the encryption works when they get the data they can then use their private key which they've shared with no one to decrypt it it means anyone in the middle couldn't decrypt the data so they couldn't do anything with it does that make sense so where are they getting the password and key from. So, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. But for now, picture it as they're just sharing it with me. Like they send me their private, their public key, and so, I encrypt and send back. The second question is, could you potentially use like blockchain for encryption? In that case, use blockchain for encryption. Not in its current form. So blockchain currently, um, you could use it to distribute public keys, I guess. but it wouldn't really provide much benefit the 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 thing about blockchain is that the database is distributed and immutable so what that means is first of all you can never change your your key which you may need to do and also you don't know where that data resides so meaning that gets stored somewhere in the blockchain uh, and distributed so it wouldn't be a good sol a great solution to this but um, what normally happens is fnb will just send me their public key because it's public so there's no there's no danger in that it's a publicly known value and i use that to encrypt and i send back a message they then use their private key to decrypt does that sort of structure make sense cool so now what that means is we can guarantee that there'll be no man in the middle that's modifying that message is safe when it goes through but there's still a problem how do i know that the person i'm talking to is actually fnb because what if like they sent me the key right So what if they just sent me their own key and then i send them the message and then they decrypt it with their key but he's not actually fnb he's just claiming to be fnb how do i know that the person i'm talking to is who they say they are and this is where certifying authorities come in so you may have seen things like thought and verisign and have you guys seen these things do you, do you guys know mark shuttleworth the guy behind ubuntu he's a south african billionaire basically but He is a billionaire because he started a certifying authority. What a certifying authority does is you register with them and they validate that your server has this key. So now 
when I want to talk to FNB, I don't talk to FNB. I talk to the certifying authority to get the key first. And then I talk to FNB with that key. Does that make sense? So now I can trust that the person I'm talking to is actually FNB. And I can trust there's no man in the middle. How do you accomplish this in your code? The really cool thing is all you do is where the URL is HTTP, you just change it to HTTPS. And all the rest of this happens automatically. Okay. When you say HTTPS, that means it's going to get authenticated. Everyone comfortable with that? When you say authenticate, does that mean what, what is being authenticated? So uh, with HTTPS, there's two things being authenticated. One, there's a confirmation from the certifying authority that the person you're talking to is who you think they are. Meaning if I type www.fnb.c.za and I press enter, when that thing turns green, we know that the person we're talking to is actually FNB. The other thing it's certifying is that the message I send that goes through all these other intermediaries cannot be modified and cannot be snooped on. If I don't have the S, if I just have HTTP, that means all bets are off. People can modify the packets, people can read the packets, whatever. So if you go to any websites, for instance, that are not HTTPS, they're just HTTP. That means the thing I was telling you about, Wireshark, can just read people's data anyone that's interacting with that website you can see their stuff okay so strong advice never interact with a site that is not https and wants data from you even if all it's asking for is a username and password for that particular site just don't use it if it's not https right just because things can be snooped on and we all know human behavior what will happen is if you put your password into that site that's http you're also using that same password on a pile of other websites. And now suddenly everyone knows your password, right? So, so don't do that. Don't use that uh, HTTP. Okay. And that handles the communication part, right? And, uh, why we talked about it is because your data has to be secure when it's moving, right? But your data also has to be secure at rest. Meaning when you store the data, it must also be stored secure. So what we're going to talk about next is how do you store sensitive data? We'll talk about passwords just as an example, but it could be anything. So let's say you wanted to, or you wanted to store users in a database, which you're going to do for your assignment, right? Yo, there was some speed, man. There is. Yo. Uh, okay. But, um, how do we, how do we store passwords in a database? Um, the most straightforward thing you might think of is, well, I just make a table. That table has a username, a password, and a user type, and I just store the person's password in it, right? So you can see your table structure might be, well, the username is Pravesh, the password is to be or not to be, and the user type is admin. That's not my password. Don't even try it. Um, you could have uh, a separate user, Ritesh, that's his password. I'll be back. Do you guys know he's a classical pianist? Yep. Well, anyway, he is. And and his favorite composer is Bach, so I did that. And his user type is normal, and I'm admin. But this is a bad idea. You shouldn't store passwords this way. Why shouldn't you store passwords this way? Yeah, someone could compromise your website, and then they can see everyone's passwords. And again, that's a problem because you use the same password everywhere. So this one site has been hacked, but now it means every site has been hacked because you use the same password everywhere. The other thing is even the creator of the site shouldn't see your password, right? So if I make a website and you, you give me a username and password, I shouldn't be able to just look in the database and see your password and then use that password for your Gmail because you use the same one, right? So you should never store passwords in plain text. So what you do is you guys did hashing last year, didn't you? In, uh, like with AVL trees and did you guys do hashing in first year? No. Okay. Well, anyway, never mind then. Uh, what we do is we use something called a hash. A hash is a one way mathematical function. Okay. So what it does is it'll convert something like to be or not to be into this thing here, four, nine, eight, D, B, B, E, D, seven, whatever, just strings of garbage. And these functions are generally chaotic. So what that means is that if I make a tiny change to this thing, if I made it to be or not to be one or something, this hash would become just utterly indistinguishable from the previous one. 
right? So they're chaotic. A small change in the in the source just changes the output dramatically. In not sorry. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, completely different. It'll become like unrelated, <laughs> or or uh, yeah. So so basically, uh, these functions are chaotic. So now what happens is that these functions, something like uh, a normal function to use is something like SHA1 or MD5. You may have seen these terms before, but SHA1 is a common one. SHA2 and SHA3 are sort of gaining adoption. But what they do is they take a string and just convert it into these piles of garbage. But it's, it's a one way uh, function. So that means it's not reversible. Meaning if I've got, if I've got this thing, 498D or whatever, I can't apply a function that'll get me back to be or not to be. That's just not possible, right? The function is entirely one way. You can't, it's not, so, you know, when we talk about encryption, we say you can encrypt the message and you can decrypt it. Hashing is different. You can encrypt it or hash it, but you can never decrypt it. It's stuck now in its encrypted form forever. Okay. So you may be thinking, well, how then do I check if someone's password is correct? So let's say I tell you my password is ABC123 and you hash it and you store it in the database as 66943821.8. Then when I log in, I type ABC123. How do you check that it's correct? Perfect. What you do is you don't try and compare ABC123 to ABC123. You compare, you take the thing the user typed, you hash it, and you check that it's the same thing as the hash that you stored, right? Because the hash is consistent. It doesn't change. If I hash ABC123 a million times, it'll always give me the same value. So I can check that the hashes are equal. They'll get the same hash. Yeah. If people have the same password, they'll have the same hash. So this, uh, was this about that point? Of hashing. of hashing. Okay, so the question is, what is the process of hashing? So in terms of the mathematical process, there's, there's, a, there's a function, right? There's a bunch of different possible functions that do this and they involve prime numbers and I don't know how they work and whatever. But how you do it is in every language, there's a function called SHA1 bracket the string that'll return a new string that is a hashed version of it or MD5. And these, these this function exists in literally every language. You can you can call it and it'll be fine. Okay. Um, that's a question of this. Sorry, I. Uh, do you mind shouting? I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hear. Okay, guys, everyone else, please be very quiet. So I got to, I got the part of that since the, since the, uh, if two people have the same password, they'll end up with the same hash. And then the next part was. No, it just uses the same password, not the same username. Do you know what I mean? So like you'll see in the, in the database, there's a username and a password. So if Prabesh and Ritesh had the same password, you'd have the same hash here, but they'd have different usernames. So when they're logging in, they'll still end up on a different, you know, with different data. So yeah, they'll have the same hash. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it has to. So the, the, the point there is that the question was, if you use the same password, you'll end up with the same hash, right? Um, and that means this hash uses the same code. The point is it has to, and why it has to is because if the hash wasn't consistent, you wouldn't be able to authenticate anyone. They wouldn't be able to log in because when they log in, you need to, when they type their password, you need to be able to hash it and end up with the same hash as the one we stored in the database. No. Well, you can hash it by trying every password available. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, so ABC123 translates to 66 whatever, right? But there's no way to turn 66 whatever into ABC123 unless you try ABC123 and see if it ends up with that same hash. That's called brute force, 
brute force hacking and it's always a possibility but it's very slow so if you do that yeah you can you can get in you know just by trying all the passwords basically but it's yeah it'll take you a long time um sorry i just want to carry on and then i'll just because i think some of these questions may be related to what i'm going to be talking about next so how do we like if we do this one problem is because the function is known what you are talking about and the password is is like always resulting in the same hash what hackers sometimes do is they use these things called rainbow tables these rainbow tables just store common passwords and their hashes so like we know for instance uh, password is a very common password so if i know the sha1 of password i can go through the database looking for that hash and if i find it i know that person's password does that make sense Similarly, I can do it for common passwords like ABC123 or the person's first name or their username or their birthday because we know these things are common passwords, right? So hackers will use rainbow tables. And the reason those rainbow tables work is because this, of this consistent hash. I'm just going to close here. Uh, the reason these rainbow tables work is because of this consistent hash. How we how we fix this problem is we we add something called salt, so that we end up with a salted hash. <laughs> and this this deals with a couple of problems. So what we do is when someone registers, what we do is we randomly generate a salt, which is just a string. It's um it's just a randomly generated string, and we store that in the database. That then is that user's salt right and so every user is going to have a different salt and they're going to have a different salt on other websites how we then use this is let's say you say let's say that my salt is ggba if i say my password is abc123 what we do then is we take that abc123 and we just concatenate on the person's salt so that means my password is now abc123 ggba right and we hash that so now if two people have the same password, they're going to end up with a different hash. Does that make sense? Because the salt has been added on to the end of it. So meaning my password is ABC123 and yours was ABC123. But because your salt was different, my password was effectively ABC123 GGBA and your password was ABC123 LLPO. Does that make sense? And then those rainbow tables, which they've ge previously generated, where they've said, I know password is this hash, doesn't work anymore because my password, even if I set it to password, won't be password, it'll be password GGBA. So I end up with a different hash. Does that make sense? So they'll, still have, they'll still see your, your hash and your salt. Yeah, but they can't do anything about it because even, if, even though they know the, the salt, they can't unsalt the, the hash. It, there's just no way to do it. Because you're just adding a bit of salt. You're sprinkling something on top. It's like seasoning for your password. <laughs> um, but it's also because what you're doing is hashing. So that's like, you know, you get hash browns. So it's like a hash and then you add salt. And then it's like the analogy applies. <laughs> Sorry, what's the question there? Do you have a reverse? No, you can't. The reason is that, like I say, the function is provably irreversible. Me oh, so you mean you could try every salt? Yeah, but but it, what it does is it beats rainbow tables because what rainbow tables uh, these these hashes are expensive to compute. So what what you can't do uh, in a feasible amount of time is try all combinations, salt them. I mean, hash them and check if they match the hash, right? So what these rainbow tables allow hackers to do is to pre-compute all these hashes. So when they're hacking a new website, they use an existing table of hashes, right? Now, if you wanted to construct that table for a particular salt, you could do that, but now it's going to be expensive. So you, you suddenly, you can't, you just can't computationally do it. Yeah. No. So how many do you have to match 
No, you can't. No, you can't. And the reason is because the salt is not added to the hash. The salt is added to the password and then hashed. Now, these hashes are specifically chosen to be chaotic. <laughs> what that means is small variations in the, in the plain text result in huge variations in the hash. So that means if, if I wanted to say like there's an overlap of one character or something, it means nothing because the hash is chaotic. Yeah, to the password, yeah. 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 That, okay, so that's a good question. How do we then log in? Well, the point is the salt is randomly generated when you register, but after that it's permanent, it's fixed. So that means now my salt is always GGBA. So when I log in, if I type ABC123, your code will take it and make it ABC123 GGBA and then hash it and then compare it to the one in the database. Yeah, you can get the salt, but knowing the salt doesn't help you because there's no way if you've got a salted hash, because hashes are chaotic, there's no way to remove the salt from the hash. It's like one entity, even if you know the hash, there's, it doesn't help you at all. It, there's no way to take the, ha the salt out of the hash. I feel like people are struggling with this hashing. Yeah. I was, so think of Here's one. Like, imagine you've got uh, like a bucket of water, right? Mm -hmm. And you pour that bucket of water into the ocean. You can't get that bucket of water back. Yeah, I mean, it's something like that. Yeah. So the, the, the intuition there was, let's say you have a bucket of water and you pour it into the ocean. You can't then take that, that bucket of water back. This is a pretty good analogy because what happens is when you put the salt on top of the password, when you hash it, it sort of, it's sort of diluting it into the rest of the message. It's, it's into the chaos of the message uh, of, the, of the hash construction. And there's no way to then extract that, um, that uh, hash out, even if you know what the hash is. Like, you know you put a bucket of water, fresh water into the sea. Doesn't mean you can get that bucket back out. Uh, guys, uh, please be quiet. What was the question? Yeah. No. So um, this is something that I wish, like, we need to have a cryptography course in order to in order to cover the sort of math. But one sort of brief example you can think of might be the square root function. It's not an inverse of the square function, although it seems that way. Simply because if I take minus nine and I square it. Um, you then can't tell whether the input was nine or minus nine, right? That, that's sort of an analogy. There's a lot of mathematical functions that are not reversible. We can apply them, but we can't apply the inverse of those functions. In, this, in these cases, we know that the inverse, not just we don't know what it is, we know that it doesn't exist. So not all functions are invertible. Uh, have you guys seen invertible in, in applied maths? Like you can check whether functions are invertible and some are not. Um, like matrices, for instance, you've got some matrices that you can't invert. So if you took that matrix and multiplied it by a message, you couldn't apply the inverse of that matrix in order to get the original value back because you can't invert that matrix. It's not possible. Does that make sense? No, there's lots of hashing algorithms and they keep getting updated because there's a balance. What you're trying to do with the hashing function is you want to make the thing expensive to compute because you want to um, you want to make sure that people can't just brute force by trying all the passwords, but you also want to make sure that it's not too expensive to compute because it's going to slow down every website on the internet if they're all using this, this hash. So what happens is as machines get more and more powerful, we tend to end up with larger and larger hashing algorithms. Um, that's a very interesting question, not one that's examinable, but the question is, can you not do a hash of a hash? What's really interesting, I, I don't even know if this is worth talking about, but, but is that what you'd have to prove is that the hash of the hash is still chaotic, and that's not necessarily true. So there are cases where hashing a hashed function actually makes it less secure because it reduces the amount of chaos in the process. Those functions happen to interact in 
in unpleasant ways. Yeah, yeah, that can happen. If it's invertible, you, not quite, but it's a different level of chaos than there otherwise is. So it's, you, you, you won't get the plain text back because the function is not invertible, but you may get something that has less chaos than the original hash. Yeah. So they're not random. Remember, they, it's a one-to-one -one function. They can't be random because others would never be able to check if the password was correct because we'd get a different answer the next time. It's not random. It's that it's chaotic. So that means small changes in the original string cause huge changes in the in the output, right? Um, and there's lots of different algorithms. Like I say, the ones you may have heard of are MD5 and SHA1 just because they're the most commonly used. But now SHA2 and SHA3 have been proposed, which are better because, again, computers have gotten better. So you, you, need, to, you need to have uh, uh, more and more expensive algorithms. Cool, but that's... Uh, it's not something that I uh, am going to examine. Uh, I just thought it's quite interesting, actually. Um, but for your assignment, I want you to at least hash passwords. You don't have to salt them, although there's no there's no cost to salting them, so you may as well. But for your assignment, um, on on Wednesday, I'll I'll hand out the assignments. But every assignment has a register ability you know what i mean no matter which assignment you get assigned to you people have to register i want you to make sure those passwords are hashed um in regards to the possible for that i So um, the question is, could you train an AI to find the, the hashes from the passwords? I mean, you could if people have used like salts that are not randomly generated or something. Basically, the thing that protects you here is chaos. Anytime you introduce something that's not chaotic, you're going to have problems. So let's say you say the salt is the person's username or something. That's going to cause problems because it's not chaos. Usernames, often you might have someone with an username like Richard or something, and then that's a, such a common salt that it breaks everything. But if you keep things chaotic, very hard for a machine to learn anything because there's no patterns. You know, so one of the things to keep in mind with AI is that it's not magic. It can only learn things in the same way people do. It learns if there's a pattern to learn. Yeah. No, you. So machine learning is not faster than than processing. Computational is processing. So it's not faster because it it's computationally more expensive. Let's put it that way. Machine learning is computationally more expensive. What you can learn with things like machine learning is if you had a corpus of passwords, like you could then learn what the characteristics of passwords are. Like maybe on sites where people ask people to use a special character, it's always exclamation or hash which means I don't have to test any of the others. A machine learning algorithm could learn things like that, but it couldn't at all learn to invert the hash. It's just, it's just not gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, let me carry on just cause I wanna, we can, we can, we can, we can have a discussion afterwards. One thing I, wanna, I wanted to talk to you guys about quickly as a, as a exploit is SQL injection. Um, this is a technique that can be used to hack websites or apps or other things. So uh, not something I'm going to test, but I very, very commonly students ask me, how do you hack? <laughs> like, there's lots of ways, but one common one is SQL injection. Um, how SQL injection works is what you try to do is manipulate the SQL that other people have used for their website. So let's say we've got a login script, right? It doesn't have to be a login script, could be anything else, but login scripts a good a good example. When, when someone has a login script, what a user does is they type a username and password into a box, right? And that thing goes to some web service or if it's local data, it checks some database locally. How it does that is by using SQL. So the username and password go into a query like select count style from users where username equals Pravesh and password equals ABC123. Everyone comfortable with that? And when that value comes back as like one, then it means, hey, we've got a user, we can log in. 
Everyone comfortable with that? Now, how that would be implemented is I wouldn't have hard-coded Pravesh and ABC123, right? Um, I would have done something like, um, let's say it was PHP. I would have said something like uh, dollar query equals, okay, that's very small. Uh, let me just make it bigger. Dollar query equals um, select count star from users where username equals, okay, let's put it on the next line, where username equals dollar user and password equals SHA1 of dollar password because I'm not insane. Okay. Um, okay i do something like that to basically say oh, oh it's on the wrong screen <laughs> i do something like that i'd say um dollar query equals select count stuff from users where username equals dollar user and password equals Uh, no, that's not, that's wrong. The quote is in the wrong place. Dot, dot, quote, dot. Okay. Now why I would do that is because what this would evaluate is, let's say I put in the username Pravesh and the password ABC123. What this would turn into is select count star from users, users where username equals, and it'll put Pravesh here because that's the username that went in, and password equals, and it'll put the SHA of ABC123 in there, right? I don't know what that would look like, so I'm just gonna type some random things. Um, and that's what would run on the database, right? Everyone happy with that? It would just put the username and the password into the SQL query so that I can run that query. Now, what SQL injection does is it says, okay, what if I'm a really sneaky guy? And when it, when it asks me for the user, what I type, instead of typing Pravesh, which I can type, I can go Pravesh. So let's say the user enters. Instead of my username, I type, okay, let's just say, you, when it, it asks me for, you, for my username, I type Pravesh, and then a close quote, and then, and then semicolon, uh, delete from users, and then dash dash. Okay. Now, what will happen is, what will PHP do? Well, it'll turn it into select count star from users where username, oh, sorry, let's do this. Username equals Pravesh, close quote, semicolon, delete from users, semicolon, dash, dash, and then there'll be quote and password and password equals seven, seven, whatever, right? Pretend that's the same string it was there a minute ago. Um, now, what'll, what will MySQL do then? Well, it'll select count star from users where username equals Pravesh, and then it's done. That's the query. It'll, it'll, it won't check the password anymore. The subsequent query will delete from users, meaning I've just destroyed the users table of this, of this website. And then the dash dash indicates that the rest of the line is a comment, so ignore it. So now, because I've typed that into the username field on this website, I've destroyed that uh, that website's user table, and I've logged in because now it didn't check my password. Does that make sense? So would it, just delete? <laughs> it would delete, yeah. But for instance, I don't have to put this delete from user. I just did it because I'm 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 an anarchist. Um, but if I didn't put the delete from users, it would let me in without checking my password. For instance, does that make sense? So like, let's say I did, let's say, let's say what I typed in the box was uh, username, I put here maybe admin, semicolon, and then I just put the dash dash. Then this will do select stuff from users where username equals admin, semicolon, dash dash, whatever. In which case now it's not checking the password. It's just checking if there's someone with the username admin. And now I can go in. So that's the problem, right? Um, and 
sadly, there are still websites that are vulnerable to this. So, um, yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be, uh, if, if you type this in, there is the occasional website that'll fail. Um, it's because it is such an easy exploit and such a common exploit. Very few websites are, are vulnerable to this. Like, don't go try it on Gmail. It isn't going to work, right? <laughs> um, and in fact, newer programming languages just don't allow it. Meaning they don't allow you to construct your query that way um, because they know that'll cause an SQL injection. So how they get around it is by using what's called prepared statements, where what it does is it binds arguments to the, to the parameters. So you have something like, select count star from users where username equals question mark and password equals question mark and then you bind it like how we did in lab four so it's not that you're explicitly constructing a query by concatenating strings you're saying here's my query and then i can bind the parameters to that query okay again like i say you saw this in lab four you didn't concatenate strings you you did a bind thing to bind the insert values it was richard and age and stuff like that Okay, and that's uh, basically all I want to want to cover today. Um, and like I say, the stuff on SQL injection, the stuff on salting, it's not examinable. I just thought it's kind of cool to know about this stuff. Uh, but before we go, any questions? Okay, uh, guys, pause for a second. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, can you, the question is, can you put code that makes it give you other people's passwords? The thing is, yeah, you can. It depends on the websites. Like on some websites, maybe like, say you go to like, um, um, a department of education website and you can like select how thing and it'll show you the schools in how thing. If it's coded badly, instead of typing how thing, you can do a query where you close the bracket and say, select star from users or something. And then instead of displaying the schools in Gauteng, it'll display the users in the user table. You know what I mean? It, it all depends on, on what your objective in hacking the site is and what um, that site displays on your, on your screen. Uh, sorry guys, just uh, I'm having trouble hearing the question and please shout. Please shout if you can. Yes. So the question is, can you avoid SQL injection in other ways rather than using prepared statements? Yeah, there's lots of ways. Um, but the, the, the easiest and most widely supported way is to use prepared statements. Um, but you could, for instance, check for any special characters and remove them. Like a username shouldn't have a quote in it. You know what I mean? So you could do that. But those things end up being like very ad hoc and dangerous, meaning you might think you've covered all your bases, but actually someone can get around it by using some other character you hadn't thought of. You know what I mean? So it's best to use prepared statements because they've been tested. Everybody uses prepared statements. So we know they work because otherwise Gmail would have been hacked. Well, sort of. You, you can... You need prior knowledge of how people design databases, right? Because like a user table is almost always called users. <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's not, maybe it's called user or clients or something, but you can try a few things. You know what I mean? So when you're, I'm a bit confused with regards to what a prepared statement. What a? Yeah? Prepared. prepared statement. Okay. So a prepared statement is an SQL query where the statement has been predefined. In this case, select count stuff from users where username equals question mark and password equals question mark. Just plug in the values that you're and then the values get plugged How in. How is that different from? Because the database interprets the entire thing in this question mark as one value. You know what I mean? Before you're putting it like in inverted commas. So then you could close the inverted commas or something. And here there's no inverted commas. It's not like you know what I mean. The the parameter gets sent as a as a thing as a as an atom in some sense to the to the database system. So it's not it's not vulnerable to this. Before it was like a string. As the statement and That's it. And what I was doing with that was hacking the string. Yeah. You know, not hacking the query as such. I was hacking the string. And now you can't hack the string anymore because the query is not a string. It's, it's a query. Just the, the question marks that kind of set that whatever he puts in the Yeah. Yeah, absolutely.
Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, that's that. Uh, any questions from you guys? Okay, I was going to talk about win SCP, but I'll do it some other time. It's late. If, you, if you're feeling energetic, if you want to connect to the LAMP server to edit your PHP files and stuff, you can use a program called WinSCP and it works fine. Uh, that's, that's all you need to know. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody.